Friends, we use shorthand all the time in our conversations. It saves time, it gives cultural references, and it grounds us in a larger story. Here's, here's what I'm talking about. Like within the, the church, I might say, the Lord be with you, and your response would be, and also with you, right? Like that's a traditional way that we greet one another, or we have things like the Lord's Prayer that, that kind of bring us together. Uh, culturally, if I were to do, say something about the miracle on ice, if you're a fan of hockey or of the Olympics, you would know that that's the time where the United States Olympic team beat the USSR four-time defending champion in 4-3 to three in Lake Placid, New York in the 80s. There's, there's a lot to be said with that two words, miracle on ice, I guess three words, right? Or... If I said something, like if I gave you a list of, of these four individuals, uh, it would tell a lot about where your mind goes with the shorthand or the playbook that you have. So if I said Michelangelo, Leonardo, Donatello, and Raphael, and you thought Renaissance painters, that's one playbook. But my mind, because I grew up in the 80s and 90s, go to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, these turtles that have been mutated and learn, you know, jujitsu and, and save the world from Shredder. And it's, it's a different kind of playbook, but it's all shorthand for the way that we then enfold ourselves in the communities in which we are talking to into a larger story. And that's what's going on here in our gospel. As we've been going from table to table in the gospel of Luke, we find ourselves right after this like palm parade weird kind of thing where people are waving palm branches and throwing their cloaks down in front of Jesus, riding on this donkey into the city. He's making his triumphal entry, and it's this weird thing, and it's a celebration, and it's this high point as we start on this journey of Holy Week for the church, of these high highs and these low lows, and all the things that are in the middle, all the emotion and just gut-wrenching sorrow in this week. And yet this powerful story of the Passover meal that Jesus shares with his disciples, and then is so eloquently captured in Leonardo's Last Supper, where we see Jesus sitting with the disciples because he takes that meal, that shorthand, and does something new with it. There is power in that. There's power so much so that 25% of the Gospel of John is dedicated to this one meal. And it all begins with the Passover. And now we're going to spend some time at this table talking about what the Passover is, what the Seder meal is for our Jewish friends, and how it enfolds them into a different story. And so as we go, the, the Passover meal is to remind people of the story of Moses and the liberating of God's people from out from under the slavery of Egypt. And if you want to have a kind of a beautiful visual reference of this, watch the Prince of Egypt movie. It is absolutely stunning. But basically, this guy Moses is called to then go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. I want them to be free instead of being slaves, making bricks for your buildings. And Pharaoh says, I don't think so. That'll decimate my workforce and my labor and the whole infrastructure that I have. And so God sends plague after plague of insects and frogs and turning the, the water into blood and like all of this stuff and livestock dying. And then finally, the 10th plague is the death of the firstborn. Gut-wrenching. And, and the movie does it in such a powerful way of this mist kind of going through the town. And yet the only ones who are saved from this plague, this punishment, are those that have the blood of a Paschal lamb just upon the doorstep or the doorposts of their houses. Because that mark, that mark of that lamb, told that spirit to then pass over this house. God's people live here. And so that's what is happening in this Passover meal. In a book, Ellie Wiesel has this imagery of the way in which the table extends from Egypt and the liberation there to our tables here today. It's 
beautiful. It's stunning. It gets at what we're trying to get at here, because if we were to see that table, there would be a number of different glasses, some for the promises of God. And so each one of those wine glasses would be toasted to as the promise of God. I'm going to, God says, deliver you from Egypt. I'm going to deliver you from slavery. And four promises, four drinks, four celebrations until the final one of, and I will be your God forever, and you will be my people. It's all about covenant, all about promise. Even the matzah, the flat bread that's there, was a reminder that the people in that time didn't even have time to let their bread rise, but that they had to eat flat bread as they were running from the Egyptians for their lives. And then we notice a fifth cup. A fifth cup for Elijah, the one who would come to usher in and announce that it was time for the Messiah to come. And so there's always a space left, a cup poured, and even a time where they open up the door that this might be the year that Elijah comes to announce that the reign of God, that the, the Messiah is coming. That all happens around the Seder meal. And there are other items around that Seder meal, that Seder plate, that allow us to then be enfolded into that story as well. There are some parsley or some herbs that are dipped into salt water so that when you taste it, you taste the bitterness of the tears or it represents the sweat of the people of God under slavery. There's horseradish, that burning sensation, that discomfort of the ways in which the people of God were slaves. There's other greens that are bitter that are sometimes then paired with this chutney that has raisins and apples and wine in it that is sweet that's also supposed to remind you of the mortar between the bricks that the Jewish people made. And at times there's also an egg to represent that new life that could spring forth for God's people. And finally, there's a lamb shank to remind you that God would deliver God's people through that Passover lamb. Now, this is all the shorthand that's going on when Jesus enters that upper room with his disciples. And after that meal, Jesus not only takes that defining moment, right? All of these things are meant to take you back to that moment 3,300 years ago where there's a lot happening and going around that table that enfolds you into God's bigger story, this God-sized story. And with all that history and heritage, Jesus is then in transforming that Passover meal yet again. And the disciples have no idea what's going on, right? Like the Passover Seder represents the defining story of the Jewish people. They were once slaves and now they are free. And it takes us back to this decisive act of salvation and what Jesus is saying from now on is that my suffering, death, and resurrection is going to be your defining story. He takes the cup and says, this is my blood which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. It's the cup of a new covenant, a new way. And in a similar way, he took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body which has been broken for you. And he just lets it sit there. And remember, the disciples don't know what's going to happen in just a few hours. They don't know that he's going to go to the garden and be arrested and be taken. And in all of that, he mentions that they will all abandon him. And Peter says, absolutely not, God. I'm going to be with you the whole time. And Jesus says, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And he looks across the table and knows that Judas has already betrayed him. And think about the power that Jesus has when he is making these promises in the faces of these men that love him and yet have also abandoned him already, who've turned their back on him. If we think just a moment about what that would have been like. Jesus is making these promises, knowing what is to come and knowing that pain and suffering that is coming soon. And so, on this night, on this day, we know that there is this shorthand, that God's table has not just been extended to the desert. 
but that it has come full circle, that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus allows us to be enfolded into this big God story in a way that invites us to be active participants in God's restoration, in God's reconciliation with the world, bringing the kingdom of God a little bit closer. But the reality is that there are times in which we have people sitting around this table that we know have wronged us, that we don't agree with, and that have already betrayed us. And so the question for us is how do we continue to invite people to come to the empty empty chairs and take up a seat? What are the boundaries and the table manners that we want to make sure that we hold ourselves accountable to so that everyone who desires a seat that is marked by grace and integrity can pull it up? I'd encourage you this week to think about, make a list of table manners that you feel are adequate to bring to this upper room table as we think about the grace that is extended in this new covenant. Maybe you want to stick around for some of that conversation afterwards as we've started to put some discussion questions after service and think and have conversation with one another about what do table manners rules look like that are inclusive enough that everyone can have a place, everyone can be valued, and even those who may step out of covenant and relationship may be welcomed back in as Jesus does when he takes the cup and he takes the bread and says, I'm all in. My grace is enough. Now let's go from this table and bring the kingdom of God a little bit closer. Amen.